started the timer yet, so <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I totally prefer to do all experiential, and so to just talk for 10 minutes is, is not my normal style, so we'll, we'll just do the best we can. So while, as we begin, I'm going to just pick up where we left off with values, and I, I, I'm going to invite everybody to bring to your awareness something that has deep meaning for you a value that you hold very, very highly. That's, you're not happy if you don't have this in your life. And when you have that, just give me a, okay. So look at the person next to you in whatever way you can do that comfortably. Just turn and make eye contact with someone. Holding that value Does everybody have someone? Yeah. Holding that value in your awareness with a connection to something that really has deep meaning for you. And then with the most curiosity you can muster up, imagine what's in the other person's thoughts. And at the same time, allow yourself to be seen. And when you're ready, in one word, tell each other what that value is. Go. <laughs> tell each other. <laughs> Say what your value is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, partner. And in one word, I'm going to ask three people to respond. How was that? Lovely. Lovely, beautiful. Filling. Filling. So my passion as a coach, as a facilitator, as a teacher, as a trainer, as a consultant, has always been connection. And Cindy asked me to talk a little bit about how I brought this work, how I'm bringing this work to a large, huge, rural, western state that's ultra-conservative So I, in Montana. So I'm going to take you back to 1970 when I was a junior in college at the University of Nevada in Reno and I got a summer job in Baltimore at Rosewood State Hospital. Now think back to the 70s when we had huge institutions. And I was 20. And a guy in a white coat unlocked a door, and I walked into a room with probably a hundred children who were mostly naked, screaming, rocking, spinning, flapping, twirling, and pooping on the floor. And I fell in love. I was fascinated. I was infatuated. And somebody said, oh, did you just want to help them? And I went, no, I just wanted to know them. And that was the beginning of my lifelong fascination with human behavior, the human experience. How do you draw that card? What is that about? Who are you? What do you need right now? You need to stop doing that. <laughs> and I began that journey of how did we all get here? And what are we all doing here? And what's that like? And who's in there? And so my talk is about you never know who's out there and you never know who's really in there. So when I was 30 in 1980, I was living in my Plymouth Aero pickup truck and I was driving around the United States looking for the perfect place to live and I decided to go to Glacier National Park. And I thought I better drop off a resume. I'd been teaching special ed for six years in Tasmania, California, Nevada, Colorado, California again, Nevada again. And I thought, I just want to go live someplace where I can be quiet and there's five million acres of wilderness. So as I drove down Main Street, I thought I better go in and drop off a resume. So I was laying down in the back of my pickup truck pulling on pantyhose <laughs> and I wadded up, this is the truth, I wadded up like one of those Indian madras wraparound skirts, do you guys remember those, with my Birkenstocks. Right. Pantyhose with Birkenstocks, <laughs> that's a look. 
And I went in, <laughs> and I dropped off the resume because I was on my way to Glacier Park to go backpacking, and he hired me on the spot to teach a classroom of children with severe and profound handicaps. So I started in two weeks, and I knew I'd moved to a conservative area, but I wasn't prepared for things like one of my classroom assistants jumping up in the middle of my introduction. I introduced myself to them and what we would be doing. And she said, what kind of people are they hiring to teach these days? And I looked around and I thought, <laughs> is she talking about me? And she was looking at my feet with my Birkenstocks, and I had a ring on my toe. And she said, I'm quitting, you're a hippie. <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be challenging. And so <laughs> I was sent home to change clothes because I was too counterculture. It just sort of went from there. And, and I was, I, in 1991, I did a trip to Mount Everest and visited the monasteries and was gone for a month. And I came back, and the principal of my elementary school said, damn it, you can't let anybody know who you really are. You go do that New Age Eastern stuff. So it was that kind of an environment that I thought, how am I going to share things like how to connect with each other, how to have a spiritual reality, how to be emotionally fluent and intelligent? And I started just getting up in front of people and teaching and giving them those kinds of experiences. It became very clear, if you've taught, ever been in special ed, you have to come up with 9,000 ways for people to learn things. And then I taught kindergarten and I realized that it's all about connection. So fast forward to 1997, I quit the public schools and I went through coach training and in 2006 I met Cindy. And I called her, we, were, we interviewed her on, the, on a phone call, we were interviewing thought leaders in the industry for coaching, and I called her and said, I want to work with you, I want to know what this is. And I gradually started going out and standing up in front of groups of people and giving them experiences of connection and then talking about actually using the language, which I hear a lot, is like, I can't say those words in the corporate world. And what I'm discovering now I'll give you an example. Five years ago, I did a leadership training with 50 leaders in a city in Montana, and I quoted Deepak Chopra five years ago. No one in the room had ever heard of him. Ooh. No one. Yeah, it, that's, I was like, and there was this little moment when I said, you know, Deepak Chopra, and they were all like, no. Nope. <laughs> and there was this moment when my ego self said, oh, for God's sake, you know? And then I thought, Rebecca, that's why you're standing up here. They never would have heard about that if you weren't willing to say it. Four years ago, I did a trip to Zanskar in the Himalayas and spent my 60th birthday with a Dalai Lama. And I came back and my 28-year-old son said, how are you? And I said, I'm living in this energy of gratitude and humility and I don't want it to end. And he said, don't let your humility get in your way. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what that means. And he said, you don't share what you experience because you don't want people to think that you think you're special. And we are hungry to hear about those experiences. My generation is craving relevance, spirituality, integration. Share it. They want to hear it. So my message is you have no idea who's out there in those huge windowless hotel conference rooms. And if you don't say it, the people in the room who are looking for it aren't going to find it. And it's a risk. It's so vulnerable. It's a risk to be the one in the room that says spiritual intelligence or intuition. Where it's come now, and it's still a work in progress, is I just started leading leadership retreats in Glacier Park, where we spend two full days in the park, in the mountains, being in awe in the natural world, and connecting around what does the natural world have to teach us about ourselves, spirituality, each other, intuition, relationships, all of these skills, emotional fluency, spiritual intelligence, and it just, I think we're in the middle of a huge shift, and this is an opinion, the next generations are insisting on it. Mm -hmm. 
So my message is you have no idea who's out there and you have no idea who's really in there. And we need to just go out and put it out there and take that risk. Thank you.